Hello everyone, this is Ronnie from the Love Fruit Podcast and usually we just start the podcast straight away with uh, an introduction to the interview but we've got a little pre-introduction today and the reason for that is that this episode is a little bit different from a few others and I felt it was best to say something just before we start the official introduction with the, with the interview portion. So today's interview is with Catherine Milton, PhD, Professor Catherine Milton. She's a professor of physical anthropology. And the reason that I interviewed or wanted to interview Professor Milton was because a number of times she's been quoted by people in the fruitarian and raw vegan world um, as if the, some of the things that she say are quite in support of the idea that humans are more frugivorous and the apes are, the primates are frugivorous and the apes, uh, primates, um, and, and humans don't shouldn't really eat a lot of meat or don't need to eat a lot of meat and, and, and so on and so forth. So I had uh, an impression that maybe she was fairly supportive of the idea that perhaps humans uh, evolved on fruit or to eat fruit and were primarily vegan and things like that. Um, the reality is not as clear as that from speaking to her and you'll see that in the interview. Um, so, but I didn't want to edit anything out, so all of her opinions and ideas are fully in the interview, I've not edited anything out, and a lot of it doesn't, uh, con may, might contradict some of the things that, that raw vegans or fruitarians wish to believe, or may contradict some of the things you've heard, but that's absolutely fine. I'm absolutely happy for that, for her, um, her ideas to get out there. So, uh, the thing I wanted to say though as well, before we, before we start the interview, is that it's not until the very end that she mentioned to me that she'd had a stroke a number of years ago and therefore there's a few times in the interview where she's struggling to find her words and struggling to get her ideas out and I wasn't aware that she'd had this stroke and um, she said to me she's not even a tenth of what she used to be in terms of her ability to talk and explain herself and think. So. You might see a few times in the interview that she pauses to collect her thoughts and pauses to try and find the right word to use and um, and I just wanted to explain that in advance. So without further ado, we'll go into the interview. Thank you very much for watching and listening to the Love Fruit podcast. You can uh, follow uh, our newsletter at fruitfest.co.uk and uh, feel free to get in touch with us or share this with other people. Um, if you've got any questions or queries, you can email us at info at fruitfest.co.uk. Anyway, thank you for joining us and uh, enjoy the interview. Hello everyone and welcome to the Love Fruit Podcast. And Today we have another fantastic guest and it's uh, Professor Catherine Milton, PhD. And... Professor Milton is a professor of physical anthropology, has been working at the University of Berkeley in California since 1980, and um, has interests in the dietary ecology of primates, including human ancestors and modern humans, and has worked extensively on the dietary ecology of a number of indigenous groups in the Brazilian Amazon, and also... Um, has done a lot of field work with non-human primate species like howler monkeys, spider monkeys, woolly spider monkeys, and so on. And um, really excited and interested to hear more about what she's learned and what she knows about, about primates, about plant foods, about fruits, about uh, the evolution of our diet. And... Um, yeah, is, is there anything else you'd like to say in uh, an introduction to yourself? Um, no, I don't think so. I hope I'll be able to speak on the topics you're interested in. Well, let's let's start with howler monkeys. How did you get? Uh, how did you start working with and studying howler monkeys? In nineteen seventy four. I went to Morro, Colorado Island in Panama because I was supposed to go and do my thesis work in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. But Madagascar had a terrific um, upheaval 
about a year before I was supposed to go, and they closed it off, it wouldn't let anybody from the United States, I don't think, even come into their country. And so I needed to find a new place to work, and someone said, well, try borrow Colorado Island, it's a nice island, it's got different species of monkey on it, you might find something there. So I went to Panama, and I went out to borrow Colorado Island, and I met the howler monkeys, and fell in love immediately. <laughs> and I study them today. I go even now twice a year. I could. I went in February of this year, but I haven't been able to go since because Panama closed its country to anyone coming in right. at all. And they, they've loosened it a wee bit, but I don't think they would let me in yet to study monkeys. So it's very difficult. But as soon as I can, I'll be going back to do some more work because I count them uh, twice a year. So, so the, the work you do is, that, is, is counting them and observing them? and Yeah, uh, it, it's observing them, but I've also done quite a lot of work with their environment, you know, with the tree species that grow there and, this, and the, and the mm -hmm. timing of their producing of fruits or leaves or flowers and so on and so forth. So, so you do a lot of work really with the environment as well as with the monkeys. And what is it? What is it you you said you fell in love with them? So what was it about the howler monkeys that you? Uh, it was just you know? so exciting. I'd read right. some papers on them, but but they were just short little papers. There was one very long, wonderful paper that was written in the 1930s by Dr. C. Ray Carpenter, and he did really the first scientific study that I believe has ever been done on a non-human primate and he did it in BCI on howler monkeys mm -hmm. and so I read everything he'd written and he was he, but he only worked on them for about five or six months on and off but he was there a lot and he did some excellent excellent work and I read it and then when I went to Panama and I saw the monkeys I just thought my word there is so much to do here you know there's just endless amounts of things that i could look at and so yeah. i got right in amazing amazing and it something was. yeah and I, I i i saw as well because i actually came across a video one time about of a, a howler monkey with um bot fly oh, parasites yeah. yeah and i believe that i believe that you actually you, you studied that as well the relationship between oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I spent about 10 years on that, you know, along with other things, but I, that was a major focus of, of, some, of my work for about 10 years. And I worked with a man from Canada who was terrific and he worked with me. And is that a particular problem for the, the howler monkeys? Um, yes, it's a problem and it kills a certain number of monkeys every year because if they get one infection they can usually fight it off mm -hmm. but they but the, but then in about three months the the the, the um bot flies will lay their eggs again and and so the monkeys can be infested two to three times a year and if they get infested a second time that will really knock them way down and probably make a certain percentage of them die the older monkeys the, uh, the, t the teenage monkeys uh, seem to go the most. And why, why did they not, because um, I, I know that primates kind of tend to like groom themselves and, and things like that, why did they not pick them out or? Oh, they can't do anything because these, these eggs are very tiny and the little tiny um, larva comes out and it sits up on a branch up in the tropics in, in the trees somewhere and when the when the how only when the howler monkeys go by because this particular species of bot fly is only found on the genus alawata so you only find them on howler monkeys and the little tiny larvae try to get on the monkey as it goes by because they can sense instantly that's a howler monkey that's what we want and so they get on and they go through the nose or the mouth or the eye and they go into the interior of the monkey right right and, and they migrate through and most of them then po poke a hole from the inside of the monkey out and they stay in there for almost three months in the last two weeks or so they really put on the, the gas and they get really big and heavy and then they 
that they've gone through three instars in the monkey, and the third instar is when they get big and heavy, and then they fall out of the monkey, fall all the way to the ground, sometimes 30, 40, 50 feet or more, and they burrow into the soil, and they stay there for about three months, and then they come out, and and they're males and females, and they mate, and then they put their eggs all over the place, and then the cycle starts again. Yeah, pretty complicated then. Well, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty simple in a way. I mean, it just happens over and over and over. The monkeys are fine, and then they're not so fine, and then they're fine, and then they're not so fine. So, um, uh, howler monkeys, um, how do we? How would they compare to us as a as a primate? You know, obviously we're, we're people. Yeah. How how do we all? How does it all come together? What, where do we? Well, they're not. They're not like spider monkeys. Spider monkeys are extraordinarily intelligent, fast, right. and so on. How monkeys are much more sedate. Their brain is is not as formalized as the as the brain of the spider monkey, and they they just live their life like like more or less like any other really good monkey species would live its life. And am, I, am I right in thinking that the howler monkey primarily lives on leaves? Is that its primary diet? Well, no, they, they live when there's fruit around, they'll spend 50 to, 50 to 75 percent of the day just eating these ripe fruits, but they always stop and then they go and spend about the last hour of the day or so eating young leaves, lots and lots of, usually two or three or four different kinds of young leaf, and they fill up on that as well. And so they're always eating some fruit, but they're always eating a fair amount of leafy material. I'd say 30% of the diet at least is leafy material, maybe 40%. Yeah. Even when there's plenty of fruit, because they, they need them both. What kind of fruits do they have access to? What kind of trees? What, what, no, what kind of fruits, sorry. Oh, well, they, they really love fig fruit, especially much. And there were about 15 species of fig on BCI. And two in particular had gotten very, very abundant um, in, the, in the 1930s because they cleared out all of the areas of BCI that had been used by people to grow crops and so on, and they moved all the people off the island too. And parts of the island were just wild and, and natural trees and so on, but other parts had been cleared for people to put in little plots to grow their food and so on. So they cleared everyone out. And then these two species of fig tree that have very tiny seeds were able to establish themselves because there was not a lot of trees and leaves and stuff out in the out in the areas that had been cleared. So these little seeds got in and the and the and they evolved and became very, very large trees. Mm -hmm. And the howler monkeys were in Fat City for <laughs> about a hundred years. You know, they don't live a hundred years, but different groups of howlers lived in these in these huge fig trees and just love them. But unfortunately, the fig trees only live 100 to 125 years, and then they die. Mm -hmm. So they've all died out. There's almost none left. So the poor howler monkeys over the, the last 10 to 15 years have slowly decreased their group size from about 20 animals in a group to around 10 animals in a group. And they have to move around a lot more to find enough fruit species to carry them through. So, so they were in Fat City when I got there with all those delicious, huge species of fig tree, but now they're now they're not <laughs> at all. So the, the the environment and how that changes really affects their behavior and the group size and, and all that kind of thing. It doesn't affect their behavior so much, but it does affect group size quite a lot because mm -hmm. I just think that that they can't have a group of twenty and survive they would have to split into so many little bunches and, it, and they and they are a group oriented uh, mm -hmm. monkey they they move in single file through the trees one right behind the other and so on so um so they simply had to get into a smaller group size mm -hmm. and i think they still have the same amount of space that they were using maybe it's a little different now but they seem to be about the same number of species of monkey on the island. Maybe there's about 
10 groups less. Maybe there's not. Um, but most of the groups are quite small now. I only know of three groups that have around 20 animals in the group. And they will get into one of the few big trees that's left in the area where they live and they'll just stay in there the whole time. And the other groups that would like to get in there too because they do have overlapping home ranges so that one group can go into the home range of another wow. group. Usually they avoid one another, but if there's just one huge tree with fruit, they'll, the other group will come in and it will sit quietly in the, some trees mm -hmm. near the big tree and wait and wait for the big groups for the powerful group that's in there to get out and they'll finally get out and go off to eat their leaves and then, then the oh, small wow. group will run in and, and eat and eat the fruit. So the, they're not so territorial about that or or, or are they quite territorial? Pardon? Are, are they territorial? Like, no, like they're not territorial. They have they have a group they have a, a given area that they use that's about 30 kilometers in 30, 30, um, not kilometers, 30, I can't think of the word. Miles? No, not 30 acres, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess it's sort of like, not the word I want, but it's the one that came into my head. They have about a 30 to 35 acre home range, but it overlaps with two or three other groups. You know, one's one, here's yours, and then there's another over here, and another over here, and another over here. So usually at least two or three other groups are using portions of the home range of the other group. Mm -hmm. But they don't like each other, and they will get into a fight if one group comes in and tries to get into a tree or something. They may get fought by the group that's in the tree, and so on. So usually they keep their distance. They don't want to come together because they will fight. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I had a perception that there was a big difference. When you talked about spider monkeys and howler monkeys, that one of the big difference, differences in terms of their intelligence. Well, the spider monkey is just worlds more intelligent than howler monkeys. Um, they, they have a group that has around 20 to 30 animals in it, I think, but on BCI the group was very small in the beginning because they had to reintroduce, they didn't have to reintroduce howler monkeys because howler monkeys had been there all along and when they formed the um, Panama Canal, the island was created because the water got higher and, and, and shut it off. And so there were two or three species that were already there, but all of the spider monkeys had been hunted out or something. There were none on in, in the entire area. And so they had to reintroduce them and they reintroduced about 20 different little spider monkeys, but only five survived. And one of them was a male, one was a female that could never reproduce for some reason. So there were only three possible animals that could produce infants and they produce infants but the infant takes at least three years to get big whereas for a spider monkey within a year the infant is fine and able to go off on its own and so on and so forth so the spider monkey has a much more intense intellectual life than the howler monkey and i guess my question is does the is there any difference in how they eat and does that affect their intelligence or how they evolved evolutionarily? I don't think there's a difference really in how they eat because they both like many species of ripe fruits that are natural fruits in the forest and they also like to eat young leaves of many different species. Mm -hmm. And so I think basically they're the same but the thing is the spider monkey will take up to 90 to 95 percent of the daily diet from fruit and only eat of some select leaves at the very end of the day whereas the howler monkey always stops eating fruit at a certain time and begins to fill up on leaves or it eats some fruit and then it eats some leaves and then later it eats some fruit and it eats more leaves so they're very different in their uh, abilities and can you comment on how do they like do they eat in meals? Do they eat one big portion or no, they, no, they, don't. they just eat one thing at a time. They just eat one species of fruit or one right. species 
weeks of leaf at a time, and they don't usually go from tree to tree. Sometimes there will be a t a times of year when many different species are producing new leaves or are producing more fruits and so on. And so they may then, that, that, yes, they get very happy in, in April. They are extremely happy because there seem to be <laughs> doing all sorts of things and they'll, they'll just wander about and, and enjoy, but, but they just go from one big tree to the next big tree so that by the time they, a howler monkey, by the time it gets through one big tree, it's pre getting pretty tired already. It has to go through another big tree, whereas the spider monkeys just swing along yeah. with their hands and zip through the trees and go fast as the devil. So it's very, <laughs> the howler monkey's just walking along one foot after the next foot, and the spider monkey's just swinging through the trees with their arms and their feet pushing them and they can go tremendous distances in a very short period of time. And they do, they go from one area where there's a ripe fig or a ripe something yeah. else to another area, and they, they, they are just awfully good at finding any type of ripe fruits that are there, and they have a terrifically large home range. I mean, I think they really use about the entire island. Mm. And do, um, do they, do they, uh, eat at certain times of the day? Like what, what, is, what, what does their day look like? Do they wake up well, and eat straight away or do they wake, eat they late? They wake up in the morning. I think the howlers, the howlers want to eat fairly, fairly early. The spider monkeys may sleep a little longer, but I think generally they both get up and they get up and they go out and they, and they feed and then they rest and then they feed again and then they rest and then if, if they need to go to other trees, the spider monkey may go to five or ten different species of fruit tree, whereas the howler will be lucky to go to one. Mm -hmm. And then, then the howler will quit eating the fruit and start eating leaves and eating them very seriously for, for an hour or more. And the spider monkey will just eat a few delicious young leaves at the end of the day. And that's it for him. That's uh, yeah, that's really interesting. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, and, it, and they have the same body weight, but, but, but when you see them, the spider monkey's all long and lean like a green string bean, and the howler <laughs> monkey is a very chunky sort of walking along slowly sort of monkey. So they just evolved very different strategies to get the yeah. same two main types of foods. And what, what kind of time of day does the howler monkey change? from eating fruit to eating leaves? Is it later in the evening? Oh, I'd, is it... think, I'd think about five o'clock in the afternoon. That's, that's really fascinating because obviously um, a lot of people that try and eat a raw food diet um, as, as humans, they experience that around about four or five, they get a, yeah. a different desire to eat something different. Yeah, well it's probably but... want their, their leafy matter. <laughs> that's, yeah, so that's really, and that's why the spider monkey always goes after its leaves too, but probably doesn't go till around 5.30. <laughs> but the howler monkey's also eating leaves as it moves through the trees because, you know, there are many more species of new leaf for a monkey to eat in right. any given day of the year than there is delicious ripe fruit. So they're always, howlers are always feeding on some fruit uh, leaves as they move along through the trees. And it's, it's, it's young leaves that these monkeys, so young tender leaves rather than... Yes. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, the mature leaves that have nothing in them that the monkey can use at all for the oh, most... Oh, really? Yeah, really. Oh no, young leaves are, are tender and soft and they have a high protein content and they have sugars in them and so on and, and the mature leaf is just a stiff mm. fellow. Have you, have you ever tried tasting any of these foods that the monkeys eat? I don't trust them very often, no, because they're not very tasty to me at all. <laughs> the ripe fruit that we eat is so disgustingly changed by our breeding habits that mm -hmm. it's just nothing like the wild fruits for the most part. I mean, some of the wild fruits are okay-ish, but, but 90% are icky. <laughs> what, what's, what is it? Are they not very sweet or they're bitter or sour or what, what is it? Really? Uh, well, they're, they're sour. Um, but they, they get they get maybe ten to fifteen maybe even twenty percent fruit at at their most maximal 
stage of maturation mm -hmm. before they become just ripe fruit. Yeah, yeah. And um, I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess what I was asking was, uh, the, like, say the figs that they're eating, are they, uh, they, they're not very sweet or they're bitter or what, what is it that's not flavored? Well, they're not bitter. Um, but I think the spider monkey will go for some species of fruits that are bitterer than the howler monkey. Mm -hmm. It like more spice in its fruit. <laughs> 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 the howler really likes ripe fruit that is sugary and delicious, and that's what it loves. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, you've also studied humans uh, that lived in small groups. We'll get to that, but I'd like to, I've, I've, I've seen a, another interview with you. I've got some other questions that I'll, I'll come to. Um, and I, I saw this interview and you said that, and this was really interesting, you said that all animals basically broadly have the same nutritional requirements. Oh, and there's a, there's a kind of mistaken idea that that we need something different to other animals need or, or that you need well, to get other animals that have normal digestive tracts and so on and so forth. Because, you know, if you're a, an insect, you can have a really unusual digestive tract and so on. But I think just talking about mammals, yeah, mammals, and we're mammals, you know, most mammals sort of require the same. Well, they don't in a way because you take an animal like a, a cow that eats just fruit i mean leaves 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 and it has all of these different it has four different compartments in its stomach yeah, yeah. and digest it here and digest it there and do this and do that and do the other and so um there are many different ways that 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 <laughs> the words keep going out of my head <laughs> that um that Ah, damn. <laughs> when they go out of my head, they really go out, too. Um, mammals, yes, uh -huh. that mammals, that mammals can uh, live on. Yeah, yeah. And um, you, you talk, you, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, but leafy greens being high quality proteins, and a lot of people wouldn't, a lot of people wouldn't understand that or wouldn't have heard that before. Yeah, yeah, the young leaves are, are very proteinaceous. But that's something that a lot a lot of people would, you know, a lot of people think that um, plant foods aren't high quality protein. Well, well, the leaves are right. Well, the young leaves that the monkeys choose to to select for their diet are yes. I think most uh, most young leaves in the tropical forest are probably fairly nutritious. Mm -hmm. So let's let's get to. I mean, I, I I guess I'm interested in what you would think about what you know about primates and and how that applies to maybe to applies to to human diets and and what would be a, a better diet for humans. The if, if we can learn anything from primates, because obviously we are in that category. Um, well, some, I th well, I was just going to say something. Something you've said is that the higher primates and apes, they primarily fill up on plant foods. Yeah, they all do. I mean, there, there's, there's prosimians, these little prosimians, they eat lots of, um, um, sorry, but it's really, maybe I'll have to finish this another time, but um, they eat primarily animal source foods, but they're insects and things like that. So that's the prosimians, but mm -hmm. the simians, the spider monkeys, the howler monkeys, the apes, all those. I can't, I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> well, we were talking about the idea of uh, apes filling up on mostly plant foods. Oh, yeah, they do. They yeah. really, really do. They sure do. They, they eat almost 100% plant food, even the chimpanzee. See, that's so, so that's interesting because... If you go and look at, if you look up the chimpanzee and you look up nature documentaries and stuff, we seem to get these images of chimpanzees hunting monkeys. Oh, that's just something they do once in a blue moon. Really? Yes, really. So, so they're not, they don't require meat for their diet or anything like that? 
no, no. But I mean, they they do go and they um, they get um, they get. Um, well, I just can't think of the words. They'll go into a nest of 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 like eggs and things like that. And well, eggs. Yes, they love eggs. But I'm talking about you know insects. The oh insects. right, yeah. They they'll go and eat many. They'll 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 eat. Um, couple of different types of insects. Like termites and ants and things like that? And yes, yes, termites and ants and things of that sort. They will go in and they will get the young, the, the young, uh -huh. the young, the young. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And eat them. And, and the female, uh, the female. Like the queen? No, no, I'm talking about the female, um, the, the female chimpanzee. Uh -huh. eat spends a lot more of her time trying to get those um those those things than than the males do i believe the males don't as much because the females seem to need it more the nutrients that are in the um the yeah insects. so the the so the primarily a plant a plant based diet the yes. animal, and, yes, and even absolutely. And even the apes that are most like us. In, well, in, they're, they're like us in some ways. They're not like us in other ways. They, they're not like us. They don't use their brains the way we use our brains. Sure. Is there, is, if, if, but if, nutritionally, yeah. you know, but remember, of, uh, of, uh, 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 A gorilla, a gorilla is enormous. It's huge. Yeah, so yeah. it can it can feed on very low quality food because it's so damn big. It doesn't need to eat expensive, small, delicious things that you have to eat all the time. If you're a tiny body size, you've got to be eating almost constantly to keep things going. But if you're weighing 300 pounds or 400 pounds, you can take you can just piddle along but right. the, the, the the chimpanzee is much smaller the chimpanzees weigh about i guess 85 to 110 pounds at the most and so they have to they they kind of have to do what we have to do basically yeah there's been some really kind of scare stories about chimpanzees attacking people uh, and them being very violent at times is, is that is that something would, you know anything about? I don't know that much about it, but I would say that if you were around chimpanzees a lot and they got used to you, I mean, if you come on a chimpanzee and it's never seen you before, it might be scared and attack you or do whatever because it's frightened. But if you are someone who works with chimpanzees all the time, um, they might suddenly, at any time, they might decide just to turn on you and come after you. That's just the interesting thing about right about chimpanzees and probably the same thing is true of orangutans and gorillas too but i don't think so they're so laid back they're both the chimpanzees are, are the fast speedy ones and the orangutan and the gorilla are much more slow sedate and the poor little orangutan just lives by itself just mm. itself it's amazing <laughs> nobody around it all the year except maybe it will go and find a girl once in a blue moon and the female is alone by herself except when uh she has a baby or she has an older infant a younger infant or something like that well that's for the most part what those two um, yeah to do but the chimp is is different and are these the chimp is like the spider monkey only the brain of the chimp i think is even better, it's, it's more advanced than the spider monkeys. And are any of these, what, how would you compare the anatomy, especially the digestive anatomy of these apes to humans? And is there one that's more similar very, to humans? They're very similar, except that the human being has decreased the, the hind gut considerably and increased the foregut because we're digesting almost everything we eat in our small intestine. And the chimpanzee it does the best, I mean, the apes do the best they can with their small intestine, but they have a tremendous area in their hindgut. And we do not have a tremendous area in our hindgut because they have to ferment a lot of different 
things that they're eating to make enough food right. Right. to survive. Yeah. So we're very different. Humans have a very large small intestine and a relatively small large intestine. Apes have a relatively large small intestine, but they have a terrifically large uh, big intestine. My uh, something I saw was suggesting that the in terms of our gut size and the area of the gut was closer to the primates that are closer to a higher fruit diet than a higher vegetation diet. That we would be closer to the camp of uh, the animals that eat a higher proportion of fruit in the diet. Well, Is that animals, the animals that eat a high proportion of fruit are usually pretty lively and move around a lot. And so you have to have a bigger brain because you have to be able to find the trees that have the special fruits that you need to eat and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's true in a way. And, uh, but, but I bet they're all eating some leaves. Yes, yes. The other thing, um, I think you had asked before about the role of meat in the diet. I think you've got some interesting ideas on that. But one of the things you said is the idea that humans should eat a lot of meat is a ludicrous statement. And you don't see, you don't see how any scientist could make such a ridiculous statement as that humans need to eat a lot of meat. Well, I think some humans probably do eat a lot of meat. I mean, you know, the people that lived in the frozen wilderness in the Arctic or the mm -hmm. wherever, I think they probably eat a lot of meat, but it's but it's frozen raw meat. It, it, well, maybe it's um, it's not um, mam it's 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 mammals, but it's sea animal, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. not the other yeah. kind of. Yeah, so so yeah, they probably do have to eat a lot, but but I think they do okay. <laughs> but I don't think you'd be very happy with it, but I think <laughs> they, they can handle it just beautifully. Mm -hmm. And they get and they uh, chew on it and just chomp it down. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so so in your opinion, that we're not our our physical anatomy would wouldn't suggest that um, or. When it comes to how we've evolved as humans, do you think that the meat has played a, a significant role in our in our evolution? I, I don't know exactly, but I think eating some meat has definitely increased the size of our small intestine because meat is digested in the twinkling of an eye. And so I think that eating animal source foods pretty consistently is part of most human diets, most Mm -hmm. ancestral human diets. But I think very often they had to eat of the animals from the rivers or the oceans as well, or they had to eat insects and so on and so forth. I don't think they were always just running around hunting big game and eating big massive amounts of big game or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably very uh, difficult to do even yeah. under the best of circumstances. Now, if, if we go to uh, talking about humans specifically, there's, there's a little bit of a mystery, I think, about as to why humans seem to have developed such a higher level, or, or what, as far as I know, like a higher level of intelligence to other apes. And also, okay. we're, diff we're, di we're different in that we walk on two legs and different things like that. Um, but what, what's your thoughts on why why we're so unique i suppose um, and is it anything to do related to diet and what we had access to food wise and things like that yeah i think it definitely is very very strongly related to diet because i just think humans evolved because their brain began to do all the work and the others, the others have to move around and run and do many other things but humans over time I think, um, it keeps going out of my head. <laughs> um, humans evolved a lifestyle so that they could do anything. They could go up trees, they could dig in the ground, they could do, they, their brain got bigger and bigger, they got better and better, they can, they can do everything. And mm -hmm. most other species of mammal, 
can only do certain things. They have a repertoire of things that they do to get yeah. their foods. But humans, one set of humans can be eating almost nothing but frozen something in the Arctic, and another one can be eating almost nothing but, I don't know, leaves or something. You know, it just depends on where you live and what you've evolved to depend on in your diet. And so it, it, humans can eat anything. And that's just different from other animal species. They can only eat A, B, and C, or D, E, and F. You know, that's their big stuff. But humans just go nuts. They, we can eat anything. We can figure out some way to do it to anything. Mm -hmm. and so that, that's what's about us. We can eat everything as long as we're able to, to cook and use tools and things like that. No, no, we could, we could eat even raw things. I think we could eat raw meat. We could eat raw vegetables, we can eat raw. Anyway, I'm sorry, my, my buzzer went off. <laughs> no problem. So the so one of the ideas of, of so what, what people seem to think is that there's there's a few different theories out there, one of them being that one of the reasons that that, that fueled the expansion of the human brain was eating more meat. And then there's other there's another cat that thinks it's eating more cooked food and learning to cook. Little sticks. It's nothing to do with eating more cooked food. Human brains were plenty big by the time they started cooking. Oh really? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what? Because I, I think that is it Richard Rangan that talks about cooking made us human. What do you think about a statement like that? Well, I don't think it's true. I think it embellished. It embellished. Mm -hmm. But I think we were doing just amazingly. I mean, you know, just running around in the jungle and catching things and skinning them and eating them. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, you think that that um, having access to animal foods was a part of the of the expansion of the brain and oh, so on? I think that was an important part of human evolution for sure, because mm -hmm. I think humans evolved in Africa. And I think they began to include animal source foods in the diet on a regular basis, <laughs> which is not true of chimpanzees, orangutans, or gorillas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I'm sure they tried to get animals whenever they could, but many times they can't get the animals. They hunt, they hunt and hunt and hunt. They hunt for eight hours and they get almost nothing. Then they'll, on the way back, they'll start looking in, in the water, trying to get some sort of fish or something like that. Or they'll start looking in trees to try and get insects and so on. So when they finally get back to their village after walking for 10 hours or more, they've got something to offer people to eat. But, um, right, so, so, so we're, we're talking a bit more about the groups that you, that you studied. So let's talk about that. So, you studied closely, I think you said six groups in, six groups in the in the tropical forests of Brazil. So these are human groups that, that were isolated from civilization, basically. They really were. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they were they were they, and maybe still are, but I don't think so now. But. And what about their what struck you about their life in terms of the contrast between how they lived and how people obviously in the modern world lived? Was there any comparisons? Could you, could you see them as, uh, could you see the human uh, similarities or? I don't know because I haven't worked with lots of different types of human beings in the, in the, in the, in the world today. So if I went to work in Africa to live with, well, I don't know, Africans, these are hunter gatherers, they're in very small groups and so on. So I think about Africa, I think most Africans now have crops and they have large societies and so on. Um, but the Brazilian Amazon until, and still is, although I understand they're clearing it away as quickly as they can now. But um, these, animal, these people were quite remote and very small and just did their own thing. And so those are the people that I studied. But I think if I went out and lived with any modern American, I mean modern human beings today, that they would be, they would be wearing clothes, they would be doing, you know, mm -hmm. everything. And although they might have very different diet than the American diet, which goes from A to Z and back. Um, yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you ate with them. Did you enjoy the... No, I, I never ate anything with them because for one thing, I was much bigger than they were. And I thought, hell, if I come in and they think they've got to feed me, they'll <laughs> run away. And so I brought, I brought my, my, my two things, my rice and my, the thing you have for breakfast a ton of that, and I, and I had a terrifically huge bowl of rice in the morning. I mean, a terrifically huge bowl of oatmeal, oatmeal yeah. in the morning, a terrifically big bowl of oatmeal. And around three o'clock, I would light a little fire and try and cook my um, rice, and I'd make a tremendous amount of rice, and I'd eat it with one can of tuna, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. just, you know, and all the stuff I brought in to live on. And so that's what I ate. And every now and then the Indians would give me a fruit to eat or something like that, which I would eat and enjoy. But basically I just lived on the food I brought in myself, which was very simple, but which filled me up and kept me going. And I was as strong and healthy as a lion. And I was just eating practically nothing. <laughs> how, how small, you, you said they were smaller than you. How, how small were they? Huh? How small were they? How small were the people? Well, the women were about 90 to 100 and maybe five pounds or so, and the men were about 110 to 125, something like that. And were they, yeah. quite, were they quite short as well? They were short. Um, they were shorter than I was. The men might have been as tall as me, but the women were much shorter. Mm -hmm. The women, may have been five feet, five feet-ish, mm -hmm. and the men maybe or five foot one or two, and the men may be about five, six. Sure. Something like that, I'm sure. just guessing. And uh, what, was, what was the staple diet that they, that, that were, did these groups all eat a similar kind of diet or were they, were they different depending on the area? Or? Well, the ones that I worked with all had a staple crop. They planted one thing, and they used that for their entire energy source. And then everything else they ate was fruit from the forest or animals or, or some other food that they got from the wild. So, but they had that staple, and I don't know how many centuries they had had a staple crop. I don't think it's been a terrifically long time, but every group did have a staple crop that they did. Two did manioc, one did, um, I can't think of the word, but they had just, they just planted one thing basically, and they ate it, oh, and one actually planted um, potatoes. Mm -hmm. Potatoes. Yeah. So they actually planted as if, as if they oh, were doing yeah. farming? Yeah, they'd clear a big area, they'd scrape it all up and everything, and then they'd put all their seeds in there, and then they'd watch it and keep it going, and when, they, when it got up, they would just use it, and they'd use it, use it, use it, until, and then they'd start another one when that one was about to go down, and so on and so forth. Mm. And did the did the men and did the men and women work together on all this, or did the did the, the men the do men, hunting, or uh, the men would clear it and get you know clear the trees out of the way and get everything ready? And I guess I guess I don't know whether the men and women put the, put the seeds in or just the women put the seeds in. And then I think generally the women sort of go after keeping things clean and keeping the 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 um, the the leafy matter growing properly and so on. I don't think the men do that because the men typically go off into the jungle every day to hunt for some kind of animal source food. And so the women are really more or less in charge of the, of the plant crop. And, and uh, were the men good hunters? Well, they, I think they were terrific hunters. They were terrific hunters, but the animals they're trying to hunt have had many, 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 many centuries of ability to figure out how to get away from them, but they will hunt <laughs> anything. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so, how, so they, they'd learned, I mean, they were farming independently that obviously they, they hadn't been shown how to do this by anyone else they they were all doing this independently 
No, typically they grew one, one huge area, and I guess each individual used a certain percentage of that area for their, for their food. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have, this is just for me and my family, and this is just for him and his family. Yeah. They had a big field, and it was for, all the women would be in there working them right. And they, were, they, would, they would all stay in one place? They weren't, they weren't uh, nomadic? No, but at one or two times, well, one time of year for sure, they do get into, into groups, maybe two or three group, uh, two or three uh, couples, I guess you could call them or something, and their children would get together and they would go into the jungle and they would stay there for a couple of weeks moving around and, and, and because then you can get a lot of animal sourced food. You can kill a lot of game and stuff because everything's big and fat and happy. So they would go into the jungle and do that and then they'd come back and, and move back into their little Mm -hmm. their little thing that, that was just made out of straw and, and might have a little roof made out of um, leaves of some sort mm -hmm. on the top and they would move back in the yeah. back. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so going back to some of the things we've been talking about, one of the things you're saying is the, the idea that humans should eat a lot of meat is a ludicrous statement, but you do think that humans would have always used an amount of meat uh, and that would have distinguished us from other from other primates. Is that the way you think? Oh about no! It? All, almost all primates eat some sort of, of of meat. They might eat little tiny little tiny animals of some sort. Or, but they but but they I think I think every single species out there eats some sort of animal source mm -hmm. food every single day. Yes, sir. So. Um, but but that but you think that would mostly be insects or it like might be insects for the small smaller ones yes insects and 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 the larvae of insects and things of that sort but I think when a primate gets to be about ten pounds or so he, it starts eating uh, small 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 things small mammals little little little. I can't think of the words. Yeah, you know, yeah. Tiny little animals that run around yeah. in the jungle, and they know how to catch them, and they know yeah. how to. Yeah, but but uh, the, the smallest monkeys probably take quite a lot of their food from um, bugs and things of that sort. Uh -huh. If there's something they can catch and kill it and eat it, they'll catch it and kill it and eat it. You can be sure they will. Uh huh. So. Um do you, from what you've looked at with this, and I'm not sure if you are particularly, uh, if, if it's your area, but do you have any concept of what, what an ideal human diet might be? Um, especially in the context of a world in which there are so many health issues that seem to be related with the kind of diet that people eat in the modern world. I think people should just eat a lot of fresh fruit. And um, I can't think of the right word for the, for the um, you know the starch starches and, yeah and but certain starches and then all of the all of the um, other foods that you can use that are plant plant based mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then I think it it's probably a good idea to at least three times a week to eat some sort of animal source foods of some sort mm -hmm. but I suppose now. There is so you know you can buy all of these things to fill in your diet if you, if you try to be just a, a frugivorous person you can make it but I think it's kind of silly because I think you need to take in your your proteins and your this and your that and the other and you can take that from many types of plant foods and it's kind of ridiculous to run around just trying to shovel in fruit all day long because the only thing that I know that shovels in a lot of fruit is a spider monkey and it's pretty <laughs> busy. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's, well, from, from my perspective as someone who's interested in the, the fruit diet and a, a, eat, eating a more forgiveness diet, um, let me ask you, let me make a few statements and you can debunk them or tell me what you think, if, if it's right or wrong or there's any truth to it or whatever. So a lot of people that eat a lot of fruit and are positive about that, their belief is that actually that fruit and having access to more fruit was played more of a role in the evolution of the human brain getting bigger than you know eating meat or eating cooked food. What's your thoughts on that? 
No, I think, I think fruit played a, a huge role, and I think that getting a bit of animal source food played a big role too, at least for the ones that were evolving there in the jungles of Africa. Um, so I don't think people were living on nothing but fruit. I really just don't think, I just don't think any of them were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't see how they could have. Yeah, well, so you so wild fruits are up in the trees, they're really hard to reach. The leaves get mature and, and you can't eat them, you can't cook them. Um, and the fruits are up in the trees, and they they the most tree species in the tropics produce a crop once a year or once every two years, and they produce it for maybe a month to three months, and that's it, forget it, you know. So, you so you're running around from this species to that species trying to get enough fruit to eat and so on. I think it's very, very difficult. And when you look at non-human primates, you don't find many non-human primates that are getting most of their diet from fruit. Apart from chimpanzees and bonobos and, and orangutans. Chimpanzees and bonobos don't get most, oh, get most of their food from fruit. Yes, they do. They do. Okay. And spider monkeys do. And orangutans? Spider monkeys do. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's primates that are primarily frugivorous. Frugivorous, yeah. And, and their, their diet, like bonobos, chimpanzees, they're closer to 95%, 97% fruit. Is that not, is that not true? I don't, I don't know because I just, I'm really just not up on what um, many other species of primate are eating these days. But... I think they just eat anything, you know, I'm thinking about the ones in um, India. Right, the right. Species there. Um, I, I, really, I really just can't comment because I haven't thought about it in such a long time that it's just not coming into my head. Sure, sure. Well, um, what, what I'm also interested in is you were talking about spider monkeys earlier on. And the idea that uh, animals like a spider monkey, they need to be able to travel wide distances. They need and to so have... And chimps. Yeah, and they need... Do they have to memorize the map of the forest and know where different trees are and things like that? Yes, um, they do. They do. And, and, and so, they know. And they know. And so that's a large part of their intelligence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like we have something similar to that in the way that our brain is structured? I think now I, I really don't know anymore because I think we just go to the grocery and get a bunch of rubbish that's all in packages and that <laughs> is not really very good for us and then we bring it home and eat it and I don't think we and I, when I was younger, you know, I would cook meals. I would cook these delicious meals. I'd have people over to dinner. I haven't done that in 30 years, I bet. Well, 20 anyway. I mean, I just maybe once in a blue moon, I'll have people over and cook something. But um, I can't remember what we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let, let me ask you now about, uh, like, obviously you have a, a passion for the howler monkeys and these animals. And I, yeah. I would like to know about, in terms of conservation, how are these animals doing, and primates generally, in terms of uh, their survival in the wild and so on? Does it look good for them, or is it, a, is it difficult, or what's happening? I think it's made very, very poor, at least very poor for every, every animal, every monkey, every chimp, every, everyone out there. I think it is dismal, dismal, dismal. Oh, really? Unless it's in a protected reserve or something like that, and it's a huge reserve, and they're going to keep it, and they're going to make sure that they have access to it, and that people don't come in and kill them, they're finished. Really? That's quite sad. It's bad. It is bad. Everywhere, everywhere I read about it, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Mm. And it, it's terrifying. Is there anything that can be done about it? Well, yes, there's plenty that could be done about it. If people would just, uh, in each country, would just get together and say, okay, we're going to take a huge area, we're going to call it a nature reserve, we're not going to let anything in it. They have done that in, I think, every country 
on earth has done a few, but I think, I, I just think that the few that they have compared to what was there yeah. is nothing. It's just nothing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the most part. I mean, I'm I sure there are some huge areas in some countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and it seems a shame because I like to think that the primates and the, the apes can teach us a lot. And if we if they if they go extinct, then we we lose a connection maybe to our own past. It just breaks my heart to think that we would lose all of our primates or all of our great apes. I mean, it just really just doesn't seem real to me. It, it's so awful, and it's just going on constantly. What's it like when you interact with primates in the wild? I mean, do you feel like you can communicate with them in some way, or do they seem uh, oh, a little intelligent bit or with the spider monkeys a bit because their spider monkeys are very smart mm -hmm. and they and they're funny and they, and they'll gang up on you if you're by yourself the males and they'll push you and, uh, and I'll go out I think God damn it I'm gonna have to jump in the lake to get away from these guys but then usually a, 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 a someone <laughs> who's hearing me will come running up and then the monkeys will come back again but I think they're just playing in a way I don't think they would really attack me but they want me to fall into the lake that's for sure interesting. <laughs> so so let's let, let's talk about what what are you doing now? What what do you work on at the moment, and and where do you work? And are you, do you do you teach? Can you tell us a bit more about what you're oh, doing? I was, I was teaching until well, I had a a, a problem um, in nineteen in twenty sixteen, and the, at the toward the end of twenty sixteen, I had a problem, and it affected my brain. Right. And so for a couple of years, I really couldn't even talk very well. And so now, as you can see, my voice has come back somewhat and my ideas have come back somewhat. But believe me, this is one tenth of what it was before I had that stroke problem. So I'm just not myself anymore. I just, um, just can't. I used to be able to think and put things together and just, but now I just can't. You know, and when and certain words, it's very hard for me to remember what they are. I can see them in my brain, but mm. I can't make them go into the part where you say it. And yeah. it's just a very boring thing. <laughs> so, I've done the best I could for you, but believe me, I'm just a fraction of what I was in, until the middle, until the end of 19, of 2016, when I had that damn stroke. It, well, it, it was a blood clot in my heart and it broke off and went into my brain. But oh, lucky, no. lucky for me, I was with my cousins in Atlanta and they called and got the, doc, the ambulance to come within 20 minutes and it took me to a place that was only about 15 minutes from their house. And so, and, and they called my brother whom I had never spoken to on the phone practically in my life. He never answers the phone. He answered the phone. They said, can we do this to your sister and he said yes do whatever you have to do so they did it and so the next day i was i was okay again as far as my heart was concerned and my, but, but my brain had been affected because i was you know if i was out cold after about a minute and i didn't come back yeah. out the next day so anyway so that's all very boring <laughs> but um and yeah. that's why i wasn't sure that i would be able to give a talk to you today because i know that my brain is just not it, the language even that I use is not as sophisticated as it was before I had my stroke. So I thought, well, I could maybe answer a few questions or something, but don't think that I'm anything like a, a, a normal scientist. Well, th no, but thank you very much for giving us the time. And I thought you gave some great answers and I, I, I like to hear your, your opinion because obviously you've got a lot of, uh, okay. a, an amazing amount of experience. So thank you so much for giving us your time today. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure, and just use what you can, and if you can't, just throw it all away. <laughs> no, that's no, it's, it's really good. I think I think there's a, a lot of challenging ideas and good stuff. So I'll just I'll just finish it off by saying um, to, to all the people that are listening or watching, um, if you want to learn more about this podcast, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk slash podcast and, and you can follow us there and you can share this with other people and, and thank you very much for joining us today with the Love okay. Fruit Podcast.
has been a pleasure, believe me. Okay, and I'm gonna go up and click on it now and I'll go away, right?